So, literally, let's get it started from the beginning. Um, what we are going to present in this uh, webinar is to go through one of the classical simulations for the shear failure mechanism in the reinforced concrete beam. And uh, the idea here is we try to use one of the classical benchmarks, which is uh, basically presented in the paper of the Collins and uh, Kuchma, and uh, incorporate uh, the numerical simulation using DANA and uh, our nonlinear parameters and material models in order to go through the process of simulation. So, this benchmark has been conducted uh, in different manners with the lab tests, actual measurements, and also with uh, some numerical uh, validations. So in this particular case, we are going to simulate and capture the real shear failure that you're going to see here. And here you can see the loading point and the support, how this is going to be developed. We're going to mimic this process and uh, explain how to capture this behavior. The schematic way and the presentation of this beam in context of plane stress is uh, as it's shown here. Uh, the concept here is basically the used rebars that are in this particular beam cannot capture the shear mechanism, failure mechanisms in this type of structure. So we have uh, basically a couple of longitudinal uh, rebars. So here in the section of A that you can see, there are four bars on the top and the four bars at the bottom. And to capture the nonlinear bending behavior, we have uh, reinforced our beam at two different locations because the beam is going to be deformed in a kind of S shape subjected to the two nominal loads, P and two times of P, to see if we can induce this uh, failure mechanism. The model and the beam is uh, located on top of the two simply supported, uh, basically, supports. Here is a fixed, here is a rolling. And uh, our model here, you can see different sections that we are considering. There are four extra lines, let's say the rebars here, and four extra rebars in this lower part of the beam. The length of the beam is about five meter. And uh, what is important for us is uh, the context of plane uh, stress. Therefore, when we model that in uh, Dana, we need to consider and take care of these cross section of these bars that how we're going to model them. So instead of one, two, we model one equivalent with the two cross section. Similarly here, so literally we model one bar here, one bar here. Each of them is equivalent to twice of these cross sections. Similarly for these parts. So we go through the modeling part, you're going to see that it's not a big deal and uh, you can nicely and easily simulate the whole process. Plus, the coverage and everything is tried to uh, model in a kind of a realistic manner based on the reference paper. And uh, the height of the beam is about uh, 500 millimeters and the width of that is 169. The material model that uh, we have used here are characterized based on the reference documents that we have. However, you can use any type of material model. You can use the material model available in the database of Diana based on the model codes or you can use uh, this uh, realistic material model, which is literally similar to um, uh, one of the uh, self-fit model with the compressive uh, strength of 53 uh, Newton squared uh, millimeter. Um, what we are going to do here for concrete, we consider the nonlinear material model and for rebars and also our loading and supporting plate, we're going to consider linear elastic um, material model. So the failure of the linear elastic for the, uh, for the bars in this particular case is not of our interest. Our main interest is to capture the literally the failure of the uh, concrete. 
The size of the bars, each uh, bar has a diameter of 16 millimeter and the cross section of each bar is 200 uh, square millimeter. So when I said here, we're gonna do the equivalent of that, that means in the sectional property, instead of 200, we're gonna consider two times of 200 because one comes from one side, another one comes from another side. If we are modeling the plane stress context. The failure mechanism that we're going to consider for this concrete model, it is a uh, total strain rotate model. And uh, the tensile uh, failure or the softening that we're going to consider is based on the Hordike criteria. And for compressive part, we consider our Torrenfeld uh, criteria that are all available uh, features in DNA. You can take benefit of them. So for Torrenfeld, you need only the compressive value, the mean compressive value. And for tensile, you need your tensile value plus the fracture energy for literally the uh, dissipation of the energy and calculation of the area under your uh, softening curve. This crack bandwidth, the H is the parameter that uh, program automatically calculates based on the size of the element. We're going to discuss about that as we go through the simulation. Uh, and you can always overrule that based on the characteristics of your modeling if you want. So uh, later on, we're going to uh, draw similar to this, some curves. Uh, sorry for that, because in my uh, computer I already ran that, so I had the live results to show you at the end. But uh, here we can go up to certain uh, failure mechanisms, and uh, uh, the detail of that is available. We can always do that uh, in a longer period to capture the full uh, failure, several uh, steps, and also the post-peak failure. These two uh, lines are basically the upper band and lower band of the failure that are provided by our formulator. And you can see nicely Diana fits in the uh, correct, uh, literally, uh, category in terms of prediction of the capacity of the model. So let's get this started. Um, well, I'm using my colleagues computer so apologize me if i a little bit play clumsy here so i guess you're gonna see my dana window beautiful so this is the dana working environment i'm going to make a new project it is two-dimensional model as i said it's a plane stress is a model we consider the uh, quadrilateral elements high order with the linear interpolation at the, basically the mid nodes are uh, in the middle of the uh, topology of our elements so i click ok the next thing that uh, if the model comes up yeah the next thing that i'm going to do is setting up my unit. My unit here, I changed the length to millimeter and my force to literally Newton. So this is my reference of, uh, say, it, uh, units that I'm going to use in this particular analysis. The next process is uh, straightforward. So what we are going to do is we are going to create this beam with the existing features. So it's straightforward. What we are going to do, I click on create, a, say, it a sheet. I call it the name as a beam. It is always easy, so I recommend this approach to you as well. So I made one reference uh, Excel sheet based on the coordinates, so you can easily copy and paste these reference coordinates into the program rather than copying uh, rather than entering them one by one. So I start with uh, that. So I copied the coordinates of my beam. So I zoom it out. So my beam is generated. I create my first support part. So I click here, my support one. So if you look at here, 
the location of this poly sheet is covering the midpoint here and that's literally the basis or the apex of our support so uh, you can consider this process during the creation of this plate or you can always use a point and uh, project that point to your geometry the another thing that uh, i want to do i want to make this uh, copied here so it's straightforward i go for multi copy I select this guy and literally in the direction of the X at a length of uh, 3, 4, 5, 0. So you're going to see where the support is located. I click OK. So this is a very interactive way. You can literally see rather than creating again the whole model, you can nicely use our copy, mirror, and uh, transfer options to create your model uh, as soon as possible. So I talk a lot to explain uh, to you, but uh, the whole idea is to take benefit of all these tools and you speed up your modeling uh, in a very efficient way. So these two are our elastic support uh, say, uh, plates. I'm going to make two plates on the top which are subjected to the point load that we have. So I click again here. Loading one, so you can see the first position is created. And as I create, if I expand here, you're gonna see how things are generated. So my I had support one, I copied it came support two. I had a loading one, and I'm going to copy this again and make the secondary position of this so i just simply from here copy that and uh, 345 you can see where it's located click ok and here you can see it automatically generates the corresponding part then what we are going to do in terms of the modeling is to create our um, literally reinforcement so reinforcement you have different options you can either directly create the <coughs> excuse me the lines or you can uh, use the technique that i am telling you right now i'm going to hide all our supports so i have a plain beam I change my filter to line. I'm going to select the lower part. So this is my lower line. And the way that I'm going to create this uh, support, this uh, reinforcement literally, is by uh, extracting a line and then moving it uh, upward. So at this moment, I change the filter to line. I select the lower one. I right click extract so here you're going to see there is a line one created now i'm going to move and in the move you can nicely select the line and then in the direction of the y you can see the green one you can nicely move it to the level of 27 so you can see it's automatically moved here so it's a very smart and easy way you you use the geometry whatever we already have and reproduce <coughs> the same things. I'm going to do the same and uh, literally you can right click here, duplicate that, you have the second one and this time again we go for move, I'm going to select my second one, transfer it in the y direction but this time 28. So you're going to see uh, our uh, basically two lines that are generated here. I'm going to repeat the same, but this time for the upper one. So again, I'm going to change my filter to uh, line. I select upper one. I go for extract. So this one is generated. So I can just simply go here, select it, and then move it down this time uh, with minus 27. So you can see it's just moved down. And again, I'm going to select this duplicate that and I move it down so I select my second one this time minus 28 so you can see in a real time you see the creation of our rebars 
So by doing that, literally, what I have done is this. If I come back here. So I modeled these longitudinal bars. I made one here and another one here, the first one with the offset of 27 and the second one with the offset of 28, and they're located in the model. So then we are going to create our uh, rebars, but this time, um, as I mentioned, in the basically two parts on the top and the lower one. <coughs> So if I create my first line, I click here. I start with the first one, for instance. Okay, so to make life easier, I'm going to hide my previous lines. So here you can see this one is my first line. I'm going to uh, basically uh, duplicate this and transfer it to minus 28. So literally, what am I doing? I'm trying to I'm trying to model these extra lines that are or rebars, which are subjected to control the bending here. I can repeat the same this time for the lower part as well. So these two lines are there. I'm going to create two more this time for the lower one. Uh, 27 maybe, I start with the lower one, and then I go 41, 50, 27, 0. So you can see this is the lower one, I click OK. So once again, I'm going to duplicate this new one, and I'm going to basically move it in the direction of 28 to come up with our new position. So if I show all my bars, you're going to see they are kind of in line, but they are duplicated at certain location. I'm going to show the position of the supports. Everything is there. So. We have defined our rebars, we have defined our beam, so what we are going to do next is to define the material properties and loads and support and setup of the analysis. So it's uh, straightforward. In terms of creating the material property for the beam, I select the assignment of the property, I select the main body of the beam in terms of the properties of plane stress. In terms of the material concrete, we're going to go for the uh, manual input based on the total strain that we have. So here in terms of the input, uh, it basically follows the table that I showed you at the beginning. So uh, I'm going to input the parameters based on the fields that are compulsory to be considered in the model. So the young modulus that we have is 37483. Uh, then uh, the Poisson ratio that we have is uh, 0.15. The context that we are considering here for the total strain is rotate. The rotate is always a good prediction for simulation of your failure. Fix uh, is a bit uh, tough, but it's more accurate. So for having a bit conservative approach in this particular case, we select the rotate in our 
total strength criteria. Our tensile curve or tension softening, as we discussed, is basically Hordike with the tensile value that we already explained in the say the earlier material table is uh, 3.82 and our uh, fracture energy 169 is the value newton per millimeter that we consider here the crack bandwidth we have a normal one and also we have a, a hovenzie based on the uh, either you have a with the aspect ratio of your elements. So if you have a more or less regular type of elements, you may use a regular one. If you have a long elements, so that means your uh, length is uh, twice of, for instance, than your height per element, then you may go for uh, Hovenje. In this particular case, we go for the normal and you don't need to do anything. Program automatically calculates for you. Then for compressive behavior, we go for Torrenfeld criteria that we have. And in Torrenfeld criteria, what you need to do, you need to define your compressive strength that we have already indicated as a material property in the table. So this is the criteria for the material model that we define. Another thing that we need to consider here is the literally our uh, thickness of the beam. So at the geometry data here uh, for beam, I can change that name. I can define 169 and uh, I can click OK. So here you can see my beam geometry is a plane stress in terms of the element class, in terms of material considers the concrete. So if you have more material properties from this droplets, you can always choose select and change that. And in terms of the geometry data, it's the beam. So with the specific uh, thickness that we're going to consider for this uh, example. Click OK. So the next time uh, that we're going to go through the process is assignment of the elastic steel uh, properties for our um, support. So I again click here. So I quickly select one, two, three, four four of my uh, support plates for loads and uh, for uh, supports. I consider steel. So we're going to define the same uh, standard material parameters for this. Okay, with uh, these parameters are assigned. Once again, in terms of the thickness, again, all these uh, supports are along the whole beam. So you can assign the same beam geometry data, which was 169 in the uh, first assumption. I click OK. Perfect. So we did all this process for our uh, beam, for our support plates, and now we are going to create a rebar for our line geometry. So this is a process that please pay attention. At this moment, whatever you see at the geometry part, they are all lined based on the specific uh, sign. So it's a yellowish with the sign of line. So I'm going to create a reinforcement and assign the reinforcement property. In terms of the selection, you can just simply select all these lines. Select. So in terms of the material property, so it's a rebar, I consider them. Material properties and reinforcement, click OK. So for rebars, we only deal with the uh, young modulus. So 21. OK. Um, I need to have a quick uh, check. I think we are on good. And uh, what is important here is the section. So here for rebars, if you remember, I said the cross section of the rebars that we're going to consider in the middle is twice of each bar. Therefore, here 
I'm going to consider twice of my uh, cross section. So each one was 200. I'm going to consider that as 400 for the uh, embedded rebars that we have. Okay. Click OK. So now you can see everything here is automatically changed to blue. So that means our uh, attribute for these lines have been changed. If I uh, go to here, you can see under the material, we have defined our concrete with a specific material property that we had. We have rebar, so with the young modulus. And here for the steel bars, uh, steel plates that are subjected to the loading and our support. So the next thing is assignment of the boundary condition. So that's a piece of cake. What we're going to do, we're going to click here. We're going to say boundary condition 1. And the boundary set that we have, we call it boundary. So we have one folder, one set as a boundary. This boundary con uh, contains two supports, one for the left, one for the right. I click OK, go to the vertex. I click this one, and I fix it in X and Y. I click OK, so you can see right away the signs that are constrained in the model. I repeat the same process, but this time I call it BC2. So once again, I change that to vertex, select this one, and this one is a roller, so therefore it's only constrained in the Y direction. So if I go to the support here, you're going to see one folder, one set called BC, and that contains the left and the right support in the model. I'm going to repeat the same, but this time for our loading. So we have two nominal loading. The left one is a twice of the, uh, the, um, the left one is a first, uh, is a factor of one, and the sec the middle one on the right side is a factor of two. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to create a load. I click here. So I say load one. And the set that I have, I consider as a load. I click OK. I put it on the vertex, force. I select this node one time. So in the direction of y, so this is my global y, I define it minus 1000, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yeah, absolutely, it's correct. I'm going to do the same. And you can see uh, the sign. I'm going to show you how to change the uh, indicators. So I'm going to go for load 2. Again, under the load set, vertex point. I select this point in the y direction. And this time is minus 2000. So these are nominal. We're going to use arc length and we go more than the capacity to nicely capture the post speed failure. So now you may uh, say, Maz, I don't see the load. So uh, straightforward, what you're going to do, you need to go here in the common. You're going to see for the loads, you can change the color, for instance, to blue. You can uh, change the size here, so you can scale it up. So you have all this flexibility in order to make your model attractive as possible to present it in your cases and in your projects. So the next step is assigning the uh, seeds. So what we're going to do are setting up the model for the uh, meshing. I'm going to create seed. I'm going to select all these supporting plates. So all the main uh, 2D bodies are selected. In terms of the uh, setting, we go for element size. We go for 25, and you can always use purview to see how this 
distribution of the elements going to look like. So what is nice here, you can see the element size is from here to here, and we are using the embedded element. Therefore, you don't need to have any nodal connectivity. If I click OK, so the model going to inherit uh, all these settings. And the next thing that we're going to do is to mesh the model. I click on a mesh, and my model is nicely meshed. So you can see the position of the rebars that are in the middle of the element, and the model is nicely meshed in a very structured and nice manner in the uh, setup of our, uh, say, project. So up to now, we were dealing with the setup of the model, setup of the geometry. All the information that we have assigned here are all transferred to mesh. So in the mesh, you can see we have main body for the mesh. If I hide it, you can see the position of the rebars. All these rebars are containing the small bits and the longitudinal one and our supporting parts. The same thing for the material properties, uh, element geometries, all those information automatically gets transferred. So if you are modifying something, always make sure that you remesh to update all this information in the mesh tab. So the next step that we are going to do is set up of our analysis. That's uh, straightforward. We're going to try to go through uh, some of the key factors together to make sure that you are aware of the settings that we're going to do. So we create one analysis case and we assign the structural nonlinear analysis here. In terms of the setup of our model, we consider the load step. So we go for the load. If you remember, we define a load set containing two load, set, two load cases. So if I go here, we had a case one load, and this one has two forces, so one on the left, one on the right. So this is my, you always need to uh, define which load case will be uh, active on your model. And then here we are going to set up of the sequence of the loading or the stepwise loading process that we have here. So I define a step of five, 10 times, and a step of one, 110 times. So these are the setup that we're going to do. So it's more than the capacity that we want. That's mainly because of the capturing the post-peak failure that we want to consider in this model. Further on, you need to consider the arc link in order to nicely capture the post-peak failure and basically the redistribution of the crack and energy into the system. So I activate my arc link control. And now I'm going to the setting. In the setting, to make the life easier for Arcland, because we have all these elements, all these nodes, and uh, to the same number of the nodes, you can stir uh, six DOF, and then you need to have this type of movement and the degrees of freedom in the system. So to make the life easier for Arcland and tell to Arcland which movement is dominant for my solution, we're going to select and define a new settings. So I say two nodes subjected right under my acting load. They are always going down. So that's basically the setting that I have. So you can see I selected two nodes and the translational in the y direction. So these two nodes always going down. So if it goes to right, left, or any other direction, they are not my answer and don't consider them. So this is the setup that I want to consider for my uh, arc length. Then I'm going to one step further. Here in the iterative procedure, I can select, for instance, 30 steps. You can use Newton Raphson, but because we have softening in the model, I can consider secant. This is for uh, basically uh, more stable and easy to go through the process. It's cheaper to run this type of analysis with the secant compared to uh, Newton Raphson. That's very sensitive. In terms of the convergence, uh, I'm going to consider the energy norm. It is very rough. It's basically to optimize the area under the load displacement diagram. 
and uh, I'm going to reduce that, uh, make it a little bit uh, rough, but usually to just show you some steps. And also I'm going to change the settings to continue. So this means if my convergence tolerance reach to this value, 0.1%, after 30, and it's not satisfying that it's close enough, just proceed, it's okay, go to the next load step. This is mainly to just make the life easier and give you some sort of insight about the model. So you can click OK, close. So what else we need to consider here is our uh, output that we want. Our output here, I'm going to make it a little bit, uh, say it, uh, customized. You can go here to user selection, modify. So I'm going to select my displacement. And then also for the crack, I'm going to consider my crack strain and <coughs> crack width. So here I'm going to get uh, crack width. And also crack analysis, crack uh, strain. So this is the setting that uh, I want. Now everything uh, is OK. I'm going to launch the analysis. I'm not going to take your time for the whole period, so let's go through certain uh, points. These warning messages that you're going to see, you can see the rate of convergence is converging one step. That means uh, there is no crack output in those steps, but you can see as it goes through the iterations, all those results and outputs are available. Therefore, there is no complaint from the or warning from the solver. Um, there are some questions, for instance, uh, they said, why you define zero for your mass density and these type of things? Because I don't consider uh, mass in this model. It's just uh, uh, I ignore the mass and the whole model is just subject to load. But you can consider the self rate as well, uh, of course. And you can define a load combination. That means your uh, effect of self rate in conjunction with the active loads that you have in the model and uh, then you have a more complete uh, picture indeed. So this one uh, kind of a uh, rough and uh, fast approach. Usually this mass uh, uh, comes when you want to do the self weight or when you want to do the dynamic analysis that you want to assemble your mass matrix. So in that case, uh, it's up to you how uh, you want to proceed and how you want to model the, say, it, uh, the, how you want to define the strategy of your model. Also, uh, there is a question about uh, stirrups or links. In this particular case, we didn't define that just to, on purpose, to show you the development of the bending cracks to shear cracks. And uh, indeed, in a complete model, you can have the stirrups. And then based on this uh, crack width, you can see where you should control you or you should increase the density of these stirrups to capture this uh, shear failure. Uh, for strops, you can also define them um, uh, linear because in the next level of this analysis, you have a different approach. You can introduce the nonlinearity and yielding to the rebar. You can define interface between the support, between the support and uh, concrete. So that means uh, you can uh, consider the opening. It's like a compression only. Uh, interface to capture this uh, or to control the induced tension in the concrete in those local places. So this is a basic, this is the first phase of analysis. You can always proceed and make it more complete and add more nonlinear contribution at the material level and also from the modeling part. The rebars in this particular case, uh, if you don't define, is always bonded. But indeed, with our embedded reinforcement, you can uh, define the uh, bonding effect. So based on the different law that we have, cubic or uh, 
schema or other uh, characteristics that we have. You can uh, always study about them in our analysis manual. You may use the impact and effect of uh, um, bonding behavior between the rebar and the reinforcement. So that means, as I mentioned, you can add more and more nonlinear flavor into this test and uh, see the impact and effect of each of these uh, uh, attributes in the overall response. But uh, if you don't define anything, your rebar and your concrete is always bonded. If you go to our website, we have several tutorials and uh, in one of them for the post-tension beam, you can see over there the characteristics and the process of defining bond slip behavior to the embedded reinforcement, it's a parabola uh, uh, tendon, and you can literally uh, follow the steps from our available uh, tutorials. Um, I think so we are at step uh, 78. So here you can see the rate of convergence start uh, 1 in minus 3. So if within 30 steps it gets close to 1 in minus 4, that satisfies our convergence norm is good. Otherwise, we say proceed further and add more load steps in the uh, say the context of uh, arc link and find the load displacement diagram. So maybe I can stop the analysis. So this is the overall deformation that we are expecting. So we have a load here, twice of the load here. The model is relatively rigid and you can see how it's changed in the shape like a S curve. So Let's see if the results are available. So you can see based on the load steps that we conducted, there are a series of results are available. Uh, I want to show you some of the results. Okay, from uh, step eight, uh, our crack width is started. So here you can see these are the bending cracks that are initiating in the model and those extra, if I come here, this extra reinforcement that we discuss here, they're gonna play a significant role to control that. So as I go through the process, so you can see how these uh, cracks, bending cracks are there and initiation and forming of our shear cracks in the model. I hope we could uh, go through that a lot and you can see nicely how these shear cracks are taking form in the system. So if you go further now, I stopped at uh, 79, so we have more than uh, 120. So you can see these cracks, these are basically shear cracks, and if you run the analysis further, you're going to see they are going all the way through. So let's uh, draw some uh, uh, graph here. I go back to my first step. I go for displacement and uh, displacement in the direction of y. What I'm going to do, I'm going to select one point here. Of course, I need to select it like this. And then right click here, go to the show tabular output. So nicely you can see here how the model started our first peak failure and initiation and development of the shear failure. If I want to bring this uh, here, this was our result, so you can see you are at this stage. So if you run further, you can nicely capture the overall response in the model and nicely capture the final failure of the structure. Again, if I go at stage 8, now there are some crack strains in the model and you can see how the crack directions are started. They're going further. 
So the value of the, uh, this counter shows the value and the direction of the uh, lines shows the direction of the cracks. And if you go further on, you can see how these lines are changing at each Gauss point and tells you the direction of the crack that are forming in your model. So, uh, this was a quick overview. I talked a lot, but uh, I'm sure you can uh, follow these steps uh, quite efficiently. The tutorial of this is available on our website, uh, and also I'm going to make this recorded session also available on our YouTube channel, and after the session, we can share the link with you. So now we have some time uh, to answer your questions. Once again, I apologize for the uh, starting technical issue, but I hope we could uh, speed up and uh, address all the necessity points uh, for your uh, attention. So please go ahead. If you have some questions, you can use the chat box or you can let me know. I unmute your microphone and we can have a live chat. Thank you.